All right. Well, we're going to hear more about professional relationships today. Um, as we get started, hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Fain, CEO of Center for Mentoring Excellence. I'm here with my colleague, Michelle Hancock, also joined by my guest, Andy Lapata, whom I will introduce to you in a moment. So very excited to talk about professional relationships today, a topic that I know is important to all of us. So let me tell you a little bit about Andy so that we can dig into our conversations about professional relationships. Andy Lopata is a renowned professional relationship strategist with nearly 25 years of experience. He's been recognized by the Financial Times as one of Europe's leading business networking strategists and by Forbes.com as a true master of networker, networking. He's collaborated with global clients like PayPal, GlaxoSmith, uh, Klein and brother, and he's authored six books on networking and professional relationships, including um, the recently published Financial Times Guide to Mentoring with Ruth Gotian in spring of 2024, which is a really terrific um, book on the subject that I highly recommend. He contributes regularly to Psychology Today. He's been featured in publications like the Sunday Times and the Guardian a fellow of Learning and Performance Institute and a former president of the Fellows Community of the Professional Speaking Association in the UK and Ireland. He also hosts, hosts, hosts the Connected Leadership Podcast, where he explores the impact of professional relationships on executive success. Andy, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Lisa. I think we're pretty much finished now, aren't we? Yeah, we're done. That? See ya. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I'm excited to talk to you about professional network networks because, um, as you know, Andy, a lot of the research that's coming out of the field of mentoring right now is on this idea of developmental networks and the importance of that. And it's, of course, something that's been important for a really long time, um, but uh, happy to see that it's getting uh, more uh, of the spotlight these days. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why this topic is so meaningful to you? Well, yeah, I've I've been involved in networking and professional relationships for twenty coming up to twenty six years now. Uh, came into it interestingly by you know by chance. I, to be honest, I hadn't heard of networking until December of ninety eight, and I got involved in it in May of ninety nine. My father co founded the business network, but what was interesting is it's what I always did: just talking to people, connecting people, thinking about who other people should meet and so forth. Um, and so it's just that fact that it's what I naturally did that made it so natural for me and has allowed me to take what was an opportunity to bridge a career shift into something that's become a real passion. Uh, I don't think you can do that if it's not natural to you to some degree or you don't have some Damascene conversion to it. Um, I, was, I was the former. Why it's so important? Uh, I, I th it was interesting the the results of the, the you know the the quest the responses to the question how much time do you spend on it? Uh, I noticed Linda said a few hours a month, but the other responses were nothing and maybe an hour tops. When you talk to people, we in inherently understand the importance of our professional networks. We know that they are essential, but we don't invest time in them. You know, I, I started out working predominantly with small businesses, as you've mentioned. Most of my work now is at you know more multinational level. But when I was working with small businesses, they would invest scarce resource in PR campaigns, marketing consultants, cold calling teams, all of these different routes to market. But you ask them where where'd your best source of leads come from? They'd say word of mouth. What do you put into that? Oh. Uh, I just do a good job and hope people talk about me. And and that transfers itself into personal relationships, personal professional relationships, I should say, uh, in that we know that what people say about us in the workplace, we know that the connections we build, the advocacy that we get behind us, the mentoring, you can go to the core of, of what we're talking about, the, the support that we get is really important, but it's an afterthought. Mm. that's why it's so important to me because we've got to, we've got to change that mindset and put it front of mind. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, when we talk about networking, often people, uh, they don't like the word, right? There's a, there's a bit of a ugh factor that uh, sometimes people have. So why do you think about it in terms of professional net relationships and how is it different from networking? It's, it's not different from networking, but it's different from the perception of networking. Mm. I, I spent most of my career in this space trying to change people's understanding of what networking really is. 
uh, and move people away from seeing it as exchanging an elevator pitch and a business card over cold canapes and warm wine uh, and into something more positive and more about organic professional relationships where you might go to conferences and events, you might engage with people on platforms like LinkedIn as tools in the networking process, but it just wasn't sticky. You know, it's too embedded in our culture that networking is a dirty word. When I repositioned to professional relationship strategy in 2019, I saw something really interesting, and that was a much stronger engagement with my work from much more senior levels in organizations i would never be able to deliver a networking workshop to uh, partners in a big law firm for example who all believe they know how to network but i can deliver a professional relationship strategy workshop it's mm -hmm. the same thing but the perspective the, per the, the perception is different um mm -hmm. so it's semantics yeah well words matter right yeah yeah um, I want to explore a slightly different topic, which is this idea of a personal board of advisors, which is, again, mm. I think, as the conversation about developmental networks is evolving, so too does that term keep popping up. So can you talk a little bit about that? What is that? And how does it relate to all of this? Yeah, to me, it, it's not something different. It's part of the mix. Mm. So, uh, you know, for me, go back to that word networking. Networking is about the understanding that if we pool our resources, we can achieve more individually than we can on our own. So you've got strengths that I lack. I've got, I'm strong in other areas where you might be weaker in. And if we pull those resources, then we lift everyone up. Uh, a personal board of advisors or what I'd call a mastermind group uh, achieves exactly that. It's effectively peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. Mm. So, uh, I've been in mastermind groups for most of my speaking career. Some of them are fellow speakers. Others, I've I've had clients uh, on, on that personal board of advisors, if you like. You'd meet regularly. Everyone will bring a challenge to the table and we will pull, you know, we'll, we'll get together on a structured format and try and find solutions. So it's group mentoring mm. uh, and it's incredibly powerful. You know, I had one major wrong turn in my professional career and it was that that mastermind group that, asked the right questions and helped me recognize that my problem wasn't a marketing one it was a choice of direction one um and actually gave me the confidence and the courage to do an about turn and write off a lot of money invested into the wrong business so you need that external perspective you need those different perspectives and the different skill sets you know, I'm not a process person. So having someone who's a process person uh, looking over my shoulder and guiding me is really, really important. But then I might bring something different to them. I I, I can be quite creative in my thinking uh, and ideas. And I'm very confident as a presenter and a writer. So I can bring those types of things to the table. So uh, and hey, I guess I can help them with their professional relationships as well. Mm -hmm. So you know, we all bring something different to the table. You're looking for those complementary conversations. Uh, so you, you can have a personal board of advisors, which is they're there to advise you on something you're trying to achieve. And actually, I have that in place as well. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second. But ideally, it's a complementary one where everyone is supporting everyone else. Mm. The, the the one where they are there to advise you specifically, just to use my example, I'm launching a new business. We developed an app. Uh, I want to bring that to market. I want to set it up as a completely separate business. We are piloting it with big companies like Harrods and Sodexo, and we're getting great responses. Mm. We're talking to a major government department in the UK. We've got a scoping meeting coming up about doing it for them. So I'm really excited about this, but doing that's not my skill set. But I have a virtual board um, of advisors who are the developers, uh, a pricing specialist is also a marketing specialist um, and a couple of other people that have got different skill sets to me. A process guy, for example, is my COO. Now, at the moment, none of them are paid. Uh, they are doing it for their, their relationship with me, their belief in what we're trying to achieve. And I have promised them that they will not miss out as a result of the work that they're doing. But they've none of them have demanded that. No one's asking for that. And they're not pushing me on that. They just believe in what we're doing. 
So that's mm. a different perspective on that personal board of advisors. But I can achieve a lot more pushing this business together with those people around me um, than I could if I was doing it on my own and without the resource to pay people in those roles um, at that that initial stage with no investment. Do you bring them together as a, you know, s- sitting around a virtual board boardroom? Every month. Every month. Every month. We have a call. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I see it come up in other contexts too, Andy, you know, so for those of who are here, who are, who don't have a small business, but are either part of a larger organization or doing something independently, you know, where um, there are a series of individual one-on-one conversations with advisors. Um, and sometimes rather than having them around an actual virtual board table, it's just creating those connections between those advisors so that it enhances their own network. Um, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of the things you can give back to your mentors. So, mm-hmm. so Ruth and I in the FT Guide to Mentoring talk about having a mentoring team. You don't have to have just one formal mentor. You can have a range of different people. Now, particularly in the US, to a large degree in the UK as well, mentoring isn't paid. It's a voluntary thing. And especially in both uh, countries and elsewhere, if if you have a mentor within your organisation, they're definitely not getting paid. You know, it's more likely to be paid if it's an entrepreneur hiring a mentor to help Mm -hmm. them with their business from from outside. Um, And that might happen in the UK. I had that conversation this morning. Um, So when someone's volunteering their time, ultimately what they want from it or what you hope they want is A, the satisfaction of helping someone to succeed, but also the almost unspoken understanding that you'll pay it forward. And you Mm -hmm. will in turn mentor someone else. But you can give more value and you can turn around and you can connect people who are supporting you. And so that's, you know, going back to what I said, it was what I always did naturally. Always be looking to make those connections among your network. And it is a great way of thanking someone and showing that you're there for them as well. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, you mentioned the name Ruth. So that's Ruth Gotian, who I believe you were referring to, who's your co-author for the Financial Times Guide to Mentoring. Tell us a little bit about what inspired your focus on mentoring. Well, I've always talked about mentoring in some form or another in my work. Uh, I have run uh, in the past mentoring workshops for some clients. It's never been front and center and core to my work. But it's always been there. My fifth book was, and you mentioned it earlier, Just Ask, Why Seeking Support is Your Greatest Strength. I wrote a chapter on mentoring within that. And when I'd written that book, I knew that the next natural progression was a book on mentoring. And what that allows me to do is two things. Number one is to extend that conversation and, and, and take it to the next level. And the second, speaking quite openly, I hadn't Networking was peripheral to what I did. I hadn't embedded myself in it. I'm a great believer that one of the best ways to learn about a topic is write a book about it. Because Mm -hmm. if you are going to write a good enough book about it, you're going to learn about that topic. Mm -hmm. And and what I've also found, um, and both my last two books tick that box, you know, Just Ask, Vulnerability, and this book have been about that journey for myself as much as for the reader. The reader's got to not be just your guinea pig for the experiment. You've got to have the end product that makes sense for them. But it made me immerse myself in it in both cases. Um, and then you go and do lots of interviews about it. And then you find out if you've really learned it. Because it's one thing to sit and do a bit of research and write it down, but to then be able to answer whatever question comes your way authoritatively, um, it shows whether it's worked or not. So for me, that was a big part of it. Um, I have in my network a number of people who also I would consider experts in mentoring. I have even more now, including yourself, as a result of publishing the book and the conversations that have taken place since. But before writing the book, I would say there were four people that sprang to mind, two in the UK and two in the US. My original idea was to approach all four of them and say let's all write a book together pooling our resources but I felt that might be too much noise and it might lose the sharpness of the narrative of the text and be a bit of a mess for the reader Mm. so what I did was I felt that the connection between Ruth and I was the strongest not necessarily the strongest I mean one or two of them in the UK particularly I knew better and I'd known longer I'd never met Ruth 
Uh, I'd only met Ruth after we finished writing the book, believe mm. it or not. Um, but we had built up a strong virtual relationship from connecting in the early days of the pandemic. Um, and it just felt that we were in that right space together. Um, so, and, and Ruth's uh, CV when it comes to mentoring is, is is absolutely spot on. You know, it can't be faulted. She was, um, I think, the founder and the assistant dean of mentoring for Whale Cornell Medical School's Mentoring Pro Academy. Um, she's been mentoring for years. She talks to high achievers about mentoring. Um, so she she lives and breathes the topic. Um, so she was a natural fit. And the other beauty about that partnership, um, now I, it's quite funny, I always say that I bring the storytelling and the narrative. I'm the speaker, uh, whereas Ruth is the academic. She brings the rigorous research and the data and the challenging everything we say. And actually, she's a very good writer and storyteller in her own right as well. She doesn't write in a dry academic way. Um, so she probably brought more to the table than I did, you could argue. Um, but it, it just... What really struck me was that our writing style, styles gel. And she brought out her her book, um, The Success Factor, about a year before. And when I read that, I knew it was right because the way it was written was how I would write a book. So we, mm. I, I'm really quite proud that when I read it, um, at the book we've written together, there are large parts of the book where I couldn't tell if I wrote that or Ruth did. Mm. It That's really great. does feel like my voice. Yeah, that synergy is really good. And it's it's hard when you have a co-author to make sure that that uh, process works as seamlessly. Um, you know, this is not sort of on our list of questions, Andy, but it's coming up for me as you're talking because, you know, the topic here being professional relationships, and you just talked about creating this connection with a co-author who you had never met in person um, through online. So talk to us, to us a little bit about how does one do that? How do you create these authentic, meaningful relationships I mean, not just online, but across continents, time zones, and all the, uh, you know, even cultural differences. I would say one of the things that I, I share in my talks is a model of consistency and frequency. Mm. So we didn't just connect. We engaged on a consistent and frequent basis uh, in a range of different ways. So the way it worked with Ruth, Ruth sent me a connection request on LinkedIn. Now, I'm not a LinkedIn open networker. I do not just accept connection requests from strangers, however good their CV and Ruth is very impressive. Uh, and so I have a reply that I send to everyone saying, tell me why you'd like to connect. Mm. And she replied and she, cut a long story short, she'd seen one of my books promoted by Dory Clark, who's a very well-known management speaker. It was Connected Leadership that you mentioned earlier. Um, and she thought that sounds interesting, sent a connection request. So I said how well do you know dory and i'd seen some other mutual connections how well do you know these people so i don't take mutual connections as it's read that we we should be in each other's circles because if you're a stranger and reach out to me saying we've got mutual connections i'm thinking well do you know those people because you don't know me but in ruth's case she knew them so we mm -hmm. said well and, and again i don't do this often because i don't have the, the bandwidth but ruth's cv was so impressive i said well and her response was really interesting i said well let's have a zoom so we had a Zoom call. Then what really worked in our favor, this was during the pandemic, Ruth was hosting a Monday night weekly show on Zoom um, that was a conversation with some really interesting people. She'd written this book on high achievers. You had Charles Kamada, former space shuttle astronaut. You had Devon Harris, who was one of the original Jamaican bobsled team that Cool Runnings was based on. You had senior US uh, Army and Air Force uh, people you had a range of fascinating people and uh, she invited me along and I went along two or three times as a guest uh, 8 p.m New York time so one o'clock in the morning for me um, and but I had some great conversations and then we just started referring each other and sharing ideas with each other and asking advice of each other so that just ended up with that constant conversation you know and even now the book's gone to bed we're marketing it sure but it's been six months or more um we've we've exchanged two or three messages today and we're whatsapping on a regular basis and we'll talk on a semi-regular basis so it is that consistency and frequency mm. interesting I, I talk a lot about commonality we, personally we have similar backgrounds but we're probably not that similar as people and we haven't really dived deep to find that out 
So this is one where a professional relationship and a close one has come up on a pretty much almost exclusively professional basis. Whereas I'm normally teaching, you want to find those areas of commonality in your personal life if you can. I don't necessarily think that's really there with Ruth and I, um, but it hasn't been a handicap either. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. How do you manage that? So I have an, a, a close advisor who has told me, keep your keep your top 30, um, meaning like keep 30 people who you um, uh, have a genuine professional connection with and show up consistently with them. Do you have a rule like that? Or how do you manage the, you know, because I'm, I'm assuming Ruth is not the only person with whom you have. No, that. no, no. Yeah. yeah. So I think it, it to be truthful, and this goes back to my, my first answer to a degree, to a large degree, it's fluid and organic. People come in and out of your life and they show up when they're meant to. And when they reach a certain stage in your relationship, that is absolutely fine. So I have a model of the seven stages of professional relationship. The sweet spot are stages five and six. So five, six and seven are supporter, advocate and friend. If someone is in that in that sweet spot, supporter, advocate, and we can throw in friend there as well, where they go into your personal network, you can go five or 10 years without talking to them and then reconnect and pick up where you left off. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be strategically thinking, oh, I haven't reached out to Lisa for two months. I need to. Because once the glue is there, it's super glue and, mm -hmm. and it's strong. It doesn't mean it can't be broken, but it's less likely to be so. Uh, if someone is in your levels one or two or yeah, one or two recognize, they recognize you or they know who you are. You're not going to invest huge amounts of time in that relationship. it will be a bit weird unless mm. you've hit in the poor, you know, you meet someone once you have a nice conversation. I was, at, a, I, I, I was very lucky. I went to a concert at the Royal Albert Hall last night. I'm sure you all know the Albert Hall. Um, and I was invited to a reception in the Royal retiring room. I love my life sometimes. Um, <laughs> this is the king's antechamber. He wasn't there. Um, but it was with the CEO of the hall and and, and my mentor invited me, actually. Um, and I I had a, a conversation with a couple of, of people there from a musician's charity. And actually, with one of them, I know a couple of musicians. She knows them really well as well and has supported them. So, And the other one... I used to work at the Royal Albert Hall in the 90s, and so did she. So we knew mutual people. So we had great conversations, lots in common. I've sent them LinkedIn connection requests today. If I started saying, hey, let's go for lunch, let's go for coffee, they'd be like, hold on a second. Who was this guy? It's too much, too soon, too quick. Mm. But if you've got people in the middle between that just met and that sweet spot, where I call it like and trust, then you can start investing some time. So if you really, it's not that top 30, it's actually the middle 30, if you want, or the middle, mm -hmm. whatever the number is, mm -hmm. where they show the potential to become your supporters and advocates, maybe even a friend, but they're not there yet. But it would make sense. There's rapport, there's trust. It would make sense to say, hey, should we deepen this? So, so if you are going to invest time strategically in deepening relationships, aim for those ones in the middle. The ones where they're established, trust is in place, but they're not quite at advocacy level. That's mm. where I would aim. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Great advice. You know, I love, um, my husband actually gave me this great metaphor of an apartment building, or I guess it was a hotel, you know, the hotel metaphor of conversations mm. of like, you know, there's lobby level conversations and you don't approach somebody in the lobby and say like, what's your view on healthcare reform? Or, you know, okay. can you help me with my career? Uh career goals, right? It's, that's the weather um, and what's happening with the baseball team. Um, and you kind of earn that level of trust as you go up. So I like kind of overlaying what you just said on that. It helps add some color to that. Let's, let's shift a little bit more um, about how to apply all this in the mentoring um, context. So um, what would be some great strategies for mentees to build authentic connections? If you're talking about connections with their mentors um the small talk that you know it's it's not strictly a gender focused you've got to find that right balance between getting a connection a human connection with your mentor 
and keeping your mind on topic. So I mentioned that my mentor invited me last night to, to the concert uh, and I saw him in the, the reception beforehand. Uh, we I didn't tell him what was happening in my business. We didn't talk about that. We just chatted about what we'd been up to at the weekend. We'd both been in the same but you know far away part of england uh by coincidence that weekend and he'd seen on facebook i'd been not far from where he'd been uh we talked about what we've been doing at the weekend we talked about the concert we were going to and some other we both love live music so some other concerts and so on i had a mentoring session with him early this year over lunch and it was the same conversation and i'd said to him then we need to change the rules of engagement and we do not have mentoring sessions over lunch because we don't talk about work, mm. you know, because we get on too well. Mm. So um, the first thing is to know where your balance is and just find that level and maybe create, as I have to with Tim, a two tier environment where here's where we talk small talk, but here's where we get down to what we need to do. But don't try too hard to build that deep relationship. Um, with Tim, it kind of works because our initial relationship is he was a client of mine. He respects my work. He's shown that consistently by booking me and by referring me. Um, I respect what he's achieved in his career and what he can bring to the table for what I'm trying to achieve now. So I, I don't need him to be a mentor who's pulling me up and bashing me down or whatever it might be. Sometimes you need a mentor like that. I want him to guide me on certain things. I want his expertise mm. more than the ability element from that relationship. So know what you want from the relationship and that will guide a little bit um, what you're trying to achieve and where you are with the relationship. If I wanted him to berate me, we might be too close for that. Mm. We, you know, our friendship might be getting in the way of that. Um, but turning to him for his expertise, that kind of works. So there was someone that I, I once approached to mentor me many years ago who I didn't actually like that much, but I respected highly. And he told it how it was. He was blunt. And that's what I felt I needed. So I, I guess the message there is it's not one generic catch all. Hey, build a really deep connection with your mentor. Um, sometimes it's OK to have a bit of distance, but that doesn't mean you can't get to know them and they know you because actually if you can build trust you don't have to like each other you don't want to dislike each other you don't have to be best mates but if you can build that trust and respect you still get a window into their humanity and vice versa that opens up vulnerability into the conversation yeah well, gives- i'm so happy you mentioned that because um that's kind of where i wanted to go next as well right so um I love and I love that you put trust and vulnerability in the same sentence because they're so related. But let's talk a little bit more about that. So what's the role of vulnerability and how do you use that and to build trust? So in terms of a mentoring relationship, first of all, vulnerability is key. Now, the assumption would be that it's the mentee that should be vulnerable and the onus is on them to be vulnerable. Because obviously if the mentee isn't vulnerable, they're not going to share what's really the problem. Mm. So you can't get to the root of it. And absolutely that's the case. But it's not only the mentee that should be vulnerable. The mentor needs to bring vulnerability into the relationship as well. <clears throat> we It's easy to forget. And I'm talking typically, the assumption here is it's a traditional hierarchical mentoring relationship rather than reverse or peer mentoring where the dynamics are slightly different and the vulnerability can go both ways naturally or the opposite direction. Um, But in that traditional hierarchical model, the assumption is that the mentor is all being strong. Their vulnerability doesn't matter. It's the mentee should be, but actually you need that, that mentor to be vulnerable. The mentor, however successful they are, the human nature, their human nature will drive them to want to impress their mentee almost as much as it would happen the other way around. Mm. And that's detrimental to a relationship. It's not about impressing either party. It is about opening up and, and really sharing authentically. That's where the learning is. So both parties have to drop the ego, leave it at the door and be truly vulnerable in the relationship. The, the, the next point here is that if you are willing to share the mistakes you've made 
where you've got things wrong, the challenges you face, the struggles you've had, your message becomes more resonant with the person listening. Uh, in both Just Ask and the Financial Times Guide, we share uh, research from Harvard Business School where they looked at the impact of sharing struggles, challenges, mistakes, whatever it might be, on the resonance of a message. And in my favourite experiment, they ran, um, we would say Dragon's Den, I think Shark Tank in the US, mm -hmm. uh, pitching style competition where an entrepreneur is pitching their business. And in the first scenario, they are simply saying, look at us, we're amazing. This is all the success we've achieved. We're brilliant, fantastic. In the second scenario, exactly the same pitch, but woven between are the mistakes, the struggles, the challenges along the way. And the researchers measured two types of envy, benign envy and malicious envy. Benign envy says, I want to be like you. Malicious envy says, I want you to fail. Mm -hmm. When they only shared their successes, malicious envy was high. When they shared their successes, but interwoven with the mistakes, benign envy was high. So if we're vulnerable and we share doubts, fears, mistakes, whatever it might be, we take ourselves off our pedestal and become more relatable and resonant. Our message becomes more resonant. So there's that reason for vulnerability uh, as well. Um, and so you need to build that in so you can have a really open conversation. The third point is the learning is in the vulnerability very often. It's mm -hmm. in the mistake. We learn from people's mistakes. So we learn not to repeat them rather than the successes, which might be a little bit more obvious sometimes. So all of that comes together. And the other part of the answer to your question is, I, so you mentioned I have my own podcast and, and this topic came up time and time and time again on my podcast, despite me never flagging it. And the topic is curiosity. And after one particular podcast conversation, it culminated all of those conversations culminated in this particular interview and from that i created a new model that i i blogged about on psychology today and i called it the curiosity cycle mm -hmm. and and what my argument is is you start with curiosity if you are curious in your conversation you then listen in a different way you listen actively you don't jump in with your response all the time and you you actually stop and listen if you listen actively because you're genuinely curious, you become more authentic in the way that you engage with the other person because your agenda goes out of the window and the human you, the human element kicks in again. I realize I use that word humanity quite a lot as well. If you're authentic in the way you engage, you introduce vulnerability into the conversation, which hopefully will catch on to the other person, which means that you both become more curious and the cycle begins again. And in the middle of that cycle is trust and engagement because they, they, they're they the glue that create that trust and engagement between the two people. In a mentoring relationship, you can see how important that is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, question came in um did Andy mention a book that speaks to the relationship identification? Is that that model, that seven stages, is that's in connect, connected leadership, Andy? That's in connected leadership. Yeah. Yeah, that's in the connected leadership book. Um, uh, okay, well, let's just uh, talk for a minute about some pitfalls, right? So what do you see that people commonly do wrong when they're looking to think about expanding their professional network and um, how can they, uh, what can they tweak to get it right? Well, I think the most obvious one, the first that comes to mind is quantity over quality. Mm. Um, so, you know, let me connect with as many people as I can on LinkedIn. Let me go to an event or conference, get as many business cards as possible, never follow up. But hey, I got the numbers ticked off. Um, so it's a combination of going far too broad, and not having meaningful conversations and then seeing network as binary rather than those seven stages I talked about. If you're seeing network as binary, you're in my network or you're out. Well, we've had this conversation. I've got your business card. You've connected on LinkedIn. I can move on to the next person. And then you never move forward in the seven stages. So not only are you not there when I need you, uh, but um, you've forgotten who I am in no time at all. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I would say the biggest mistake is okay, I've got that person, now I'll move on to the next, quantity over quality. Um, so, so that's probably the key thing. The, the, the second biggest mistake uh, off the top of my head is, I would, I would think, is asking for help too soon or even offering help too soon. Now, there are times when it becomes 
uh, a natural thing to to um, you need to ask for help at an early stage in a relationship. But I have a simple model. And I think I mentioned consistency and frequency earlier mm. um, where on them, the graph, I have a consistency and frequency. I've got two um, two star points. One of them is when you ask for help too soon. And I show the relationship deteriorating because you've asked too soon. The other is when you ask when the relationship is established and I show the relationship deepening, getting better because people enjoy helping people they know, like, and trust. Mm. So, you know, hold back. Um, and, and related to that, I would say the third mistake is treating every relationship as a transaction and a quid pro quo. So I've helped you. So now you owe me. Mm. So I'm sure people on this call will have number of people on this call will have read Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people and will be familiar with his concept of emotional bank accounts. If you're not, that's where Covey said relationships are like bank accounts. You don't walk into a bank and ask to withdraw money. If you haven't deposited in the first place, you, you deposit first and then you withdraw. I have a spin on that. And that is that I can go into a bank in London and pay in a hundred pounds tomorrow. Uh, because it's too late now it's nearly six o'clock so they're they're all closed <laughs> if i can find a branch, if i can find a branch um yeah. but then i can get on a flight to new york i can go into a completely different bank different business a new york branch i can withdraw the, the the equivalent in dollars tomorrow the day after tomorrow um or even same day <laughs> yeah. get a flight um and, and and i see relationships in the same way so when I'm depositing, I'm not depositing in my relationship with you, Lisa, and expecting you to give back, but I, I'm depositing with you, but I might get something back from Linda. You might help Mark. Mark might help Terence. Terence might help Linda. And the bank account is your network, not the individual. The mistake mm -hmm. people make is individual, and it makes it transactional. Now, when you take that away, it removes the pressure. From a relationship so it's not always looking for something it's just about am i finding interesting people am i finding people that someday i can help them or they can help me or between us we can help someone else or you know what none of that might happen over the whole of our life but i enjoy their company and you've got to find that balance between i need to know you because i need your help um and i don't know how you can help me but I like knowing you and we want both in our lives. We've got to find a blend of those somewhere rather than being too strategic or too relational. Yeah. I, I love, um, I love that analogy and let me riff on it for a second, which yeah. is what if it's not a bank account and it's an investment account, right? Yeah. You know, and you get, and the dividend comes, you know, there's psychic dividends, there's psychological dividends there, you know, all of those things. So um, yeah, I, I work a lot with the pensions industry and I just say to them, it's a pension. Mm. You know, you're not, you're not paying in today and expecting out tomorrow. It, it, you, you might expect that in five years, 10 years. And a lot of people I work with, I work at all levels. Um, but even with senior leadership these days, I've reached that stage in my life where I'm older than the senior leaders, uh, frighteningly. <laughs> I, I'm right so, there with you. Yeah. <laughs> so even with senior leadership teams, I'm saying you've got 20 more years in your career. Yeah. You know, I'm getting dividends from people that I invested in 20 years ago. Yeah. 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 It's a really powerful metaphor, actually. Really powerful metaphor. One more question, and then I want to make sure that folks have a chance to ask, but how do you see this all evolving? You know, in we've got this remote, these remote work environments, these these businesses that are that have employees that never meet, um, and certainly industries like ours, um, where you know we're cross continent uh, and what have you. Like, how does how do you see mentorship evolving in this context, and what does it mean for us developing our professional relationships? You know, before the pandemic, and I was used to virtual meetings. You know, I, I probably Skype back then. And funny, Skype seems like an old technology, out of date technology now, like AOL, um, right? But, <laughs> yeah and i had meetings on that and i would you know I, I i wasn't unfamiliar with 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 the format um but before um be before the pandemic i could never see myself mentoring virtually i didn't think i had the the discipline 
for it. Oh, I'll be looking at my email the whole time and I can't focus and so forth. It's how I do 90 plus percent of my mentoring and I'm used to it. I still would prefer to be in person, but it's not practical. A lot of the people I mentor are, are based internationally, often their teams. You know, I do a lot of group mentoring and they're in different countries to each other. So I love it when I get the chance to mentor in person, but most of it is virtual. I think that's been normalized already. Uh, and I think people are used to that. So I don't think it's a question of how it will evolve. I think it's how it has evolved. Um, and that opens up far more potential for different types of mentoring and more creative thinking around mentoring. I think we have got stuck in a rut of thinking mentoring programs should be internal within one company. And it's the senior people in that company mentoring the junior people in, in others. So, you know, reverse mentoring has grown in strength as well. So that's shifting. But it's really interesting when I have conversations with organisers of internal mentoring programmes and they've never considered an exchange of mentors and mentees with another firm, maybe even in a completely different sector. You know, mm -hmm. I met with um, the, the the senior lead L and D leaders in a big uh, law firm. No, sorry, accountancy firm uh, recently, and they've been looking at their mentoring program. And I said, "Why don't you create mentoring with people in the creative industry? Because they'll look at things from a totally different lens to you and different perspective. They'll have the same challenges." And they loved it, but it doesn't happen because it's that bit of extra work. Mm. Maybe with the the, ad, the, the you know the advent of more virtual tools ai comes into this as well it may well create more space to be more creative about how we create mentoring programs we've also got to look at uh, how we engage people in mentoring programs because you've got a generation in the workplace you know the 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 gen z's the you'll have the gen alphas coming in in no time and they don't want to be told what to do you know you're on a mentoring program do this do that they're not interested they want to be treated as a consumer uh, we need to use storytelling we need to create more advocacy within organizations from senior leaders about the impact mentoring has had on their career we've got to create the support for mentoring um, not just from senior leaders, you know, in words, um, but leaders throughout the organization through to managers and colleagues who don't make someone feel awkward about taking time away from their desk because they've got a mentoring meeting mm -hmm. or time aside to do some work that their mentor has tasked them with. Um, it, it's, it's easy to forget about where mentoring can fall down because it's not supported by line managers and peers. Um, so we need to be thinking about things like that and how it's sold and the narrative within the company culture um, about you know what mentoring is and why it's so important for everyone, whether you're involved or not. We've got to look at accessibility. You know, mentoring isn't just for people who are on the fast track talent program or board talent board, board track talent programs mentoring should be for everyone wherever they are okay you know if you are a retail organization who employs casual staff over christmas maybe not offering them mentoring you know th there's a line but permanent staff that are there long term or you want to be there long term it's key another change that i see coming in is a change in mindset because again generational shift younger generations um are looking at portfolio careers and ever-changing careers job for life stopped existing a long time ago to be honest with you but we've gone further and further away from it so they're now you're now looking at the average stay in a in a company for a millennial is two years mm. they have a mentor it's five so there's an argument for mentoring but the mindset of businesses typically tends to be why should i invest in that person if they're going to leave me anyway what it should be is i've got a societal interest in investing in that person whether or not they leave me i'm doing this for them not for the company but if i do invest in them if they do leave a they're more likely to stay b if they do leave they're going to talk about us in a positive way to other people and see if everyone does this, I'm going to recruit better trained, better supported people in the first place. So we need a, sh a mindset shift at a senior level about why we're doing this. And again, studies show that millennials and Gen Zs want 
their managers to be interested in them as a person and their life as a whole. They don't want a coach on a project. They want someone interested in their long-term development. So we need to change our whole relationship with mentoring. You probably get the sense I could go on and on and on with these different trends and where things are. Well, it's like music to my ears, Andy. I mean, you know, there's so much there that I I want to dig in uh, more. Uh, One piece I like, I would just be remiss if I didn't comment on because it's so integral to what we do at Center for Mentoring Excellence and my own view on inclusion in the workplace is your point about offering mentoring more broadly, not just to the high potentials, but as a tool really for inclusion. If you want to bring more people up to those high performing levels and have uh, that be a more inclusive offering mentoring um, throughout the organization. So, so, so. Can can I come in on inclusion as well? Because I think it's a really important point here. And that is that we've, Ruth brought this to the table, my co-author. I don't want to claim credit for it, but it was really interesting to me and it came out in interviews that I conducted once I knew about it. And she talked about the minority tax. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't thought about this before, but um, if you are a woman in a senior level in an organisation, if you're a person of colour, if you come from any ethnic minority or underrepresented group, LGBTQ plus would be another example, in an organisation and you're at a senior level, any organization is going to be pyramid shaped with uh, in terms of representation with if you're an underrepresented group by nature there are fewer people at the top than there are of the the, the the mainstream group as you go through the organization with recruitment practices having coming in the last few years then that the underrepresentation shifts and there are a lot more people from that minority group so they're all potentially going to be going to the same person to mentor them so that underrepresented senior leader gets taxed Ruth calls this the minority tax because they will have more people ask them for mentoring than let's say their white male straight colleague and we've got to look at the impact of that and either how we enable those leaders to manage that load in a way that doesn't disadvantage them or how we create the ability for people from the main well-represented group to mentor people underrepresented from underrepresented groups in a way that has understanding and empathy and can provide them with the support that they need. I'd go for, I prefer the latter route mm-hmm. if we can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As we say, uh, louder for the people in the back. That's uh, absolutely <laughs> agree with that. Um Andy, before we let folks go, any um, parting words? I don't see any questions. Actually, before I give you a chance for parting words, anyone here have a question that they want to uh, either unmute to ask or put in the chat? I didn't have a question, just just a, a comment, though, just from something uh, that Andy said in the beginning. I think it just really resonated with me when you, you know, talked a bit about networking and sort of the negative connotation that has and it just opened my opened my mind a bit to to look at that a little differently when we're looking at professional relationship you know i i think i make a lot of connections and i really enjoy it but i've always looked at it but i don't don't want anything to do with networking so i appreciated that comment it uh, really opened my mind thank you thank you mark thanks excellent um andy any hurting words for our uh before i've enjoyed the conversation and and i hope that others do um and and thank you um particularly and this doesn't pick on those who haven't but i appreciate those of you who turned your cameras on Uh, i know that not everyone is comfortable with it and not everyone can so there's not picking on anyone else there um but if we're talking about connection you know my life has become this give presentations on zoom and just a little note on connection is it's so much easier to connect when you can see people and you can see the responses so always bear that in mind when you're on on calls like this Uh, it's just those smallest little things but within that just think about your setup and your layout I've I've had meetings with people and I have two screens here but what I do is I position my cam my, my zoom window just under my camera and the person who's speaking teams you can't do this but zoom you can person who's speaking i drag underneath the camera so my eyes are as close to the camera as possible but can see them as well i've had people who have got their camera by one screen and their their window on another so they effectively are talking like this the whole time and i'm seeing the Mm -hmm. side of their face just little things like that make the hugest difference and i think that just 
e extrapolating that point, if I want a closing comment, it's the little things, the yeah. little things that make a huge difference. It doesn't have to be hard work. It can be as simple as sending someone a note saying, hey, we haven't spoken for a while. How have you been? Not here's what I've been up to. How have you been? what's happening in your world making things about them not about you reaching out when you don't need something when there's no agenda these sort of small touches are what makes all the difference in professional relationships going back to stephen covey invest in that 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 investment scheme you know and, and it's not invest one big thing and that's it but i don't put my hundred pound in tomorrow i put a pound in you know every occasional day and it accrues over time so just when you finish this call, you know, for you guys, it's it's lunchtime, I guess, for most of you and even earlier in the day for some. Um, what can you do today? What, How can you touch someone in your network in an appropriate way um, that's just going to invest in the relationship with them and make a difference? And just little things like that are, are mm -hmm. the key thing. Beautiful, Andy. Thank you so, so much for that. As you see on the screen, we've included ways to get in touch with you um, and uh, also with me if, for those who would like to. Um, a little bit of a call uh, to action for folks. We're, January is National Mentoring Month, and each year we do interviews with longstanding mentoring relationships. So if you've been in a mentoring relationship for five years or more and you and your mentoring partner are interested in talking with us in January, let us know. Um, we're putting that together now. Um, and uh, we're taking a break for December because of the holidays, but we'll be resuming again uh, in January for the Thought Leader Conversations. Um, Andy, I have so many, so much more. I mean, I wish you could see my notes. It's like hard to ask questions and take notes at the same time. So, um, but lots for us to follow up on in uh, future discussions. Grateful for your time. Thank you everybody for joining and um, go forth and mentor on. Thank you, everyone.